Welcome, everybody, and thanks for joining us at this World Wildlife Fund Forest and Climate Initiative online learning session. My name is Breen Burns, and I'll be your facilitator today. Our topic is satellite data for red MRV, and our speakers are Orly Shapiro of WWF Germany and Axel Pendorf of RapidEye. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly go over a few things. First, please make sure that your microphone, which is the green icon next to your name, is muted to help reduce background noise. Second, please use and watch your chat window. You can use this feature during the presentation to contact me if you're having technical difficulties. And finally, please hold your questions until the end of the session. You should submit your questions through the question panel, which is on your list of options and I will read them aloud to our presenters. Thanks again for joining us, and with that, I will turn it over to Orly. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to talk about uh, the various different satellite data available for your RED MRV projects. Um, I'll go over a few topics before I hand over the presentation to Axel, and uh, these topics first are all about the different satellite imagery types out there the resolution, the frequency, how to select um, satellite imagery for your RED project. And things that go along with that are budgeting for the imagery, um, some tips on forest monitoring for RED, where and how to get data. And then we'll have a spotlight on RapidEye, um, which is a German company located next to us in Berlin and um, is one of the newest providers of high frequency and high resolution data um, and specifically can be used for RED MRV. Next. So just a little background on our WWF vision for RED Plus. Um, we're looking for a program that um, where RED significantly contributes to conservation of forests and providing livelihoods for people and reducing deforestation and degradation, degradation for nature. We believe in an effective RED mechanism that will be part of a global climate solution. Um, and if we don't scale up our RED actions now, um, it will be impossible to ensure that global warming is kept to a reasonable uh, level under 2 degrees C. Next. So why are we talking about satellite imagery today? Well, um, the UNFCCC recommends using a combination of remote sensing and ground-based forest carbon inventory data for obtaining estimates on forest-related emissions. So your forest monitoring, your forest carbon emissions should all be developed basically uh, from a remote sensing perspective, so using satellite imagery. Next. So if we were to choose some satellites to um, work on our RED project, this slide here just shows you that there's a lot to choose from. This is an artist's rendering. It's not actual scale of um, pretty much all of the satellites that have been launched since the first satellite. Um, there are over 1,000 launches that have occurred since the, the beginning of our space programs. And, well, there's a lot of satellites still up there. They, may, they might not all be in operation still, uh, but there's a lot of, lot of data to choose from. And that's part of my role at WWF as a remote sensing specialist, is to help people determine which satellite is applicable for their RED project. And that's what I'll talk about in the next slide. Right, so we've seen all of these different choices of satellites. So basically, your first step in developing your RED MRV project is to choose um, the right satellite image for your project, and that includes looking at resolution. Uh, the resolution is the uh, basically the detail of the image, um, and it can range anywhere from 40 centimeters, meaning you can see something the size of a coffee table, um, up to foot five kilometers, which is basically a large forest uh, tract. So there's every resolution in between. Um, there's a lot of options to choose from. There's also something related to the spectral wavelengths, and that means um, how the, the satellite views the ground. There are optical satellites, meaning you can view um, you know, color visible, visible colors like red, green, and blue, near infrared, um, and there's a lot of um, satellites related to that. And secondly, there are what we call active sensors or radar, and these are satellites that actually uh, send signals down to the ground and then measure the, um, how they bounce back, and, the, and these can penetrate clouds, um, and they're particularly good for detecting forest cover, canopy thickness, and things like that. So um, depending on the goal of your project, you know, you can select between optical or active sensors if you have a really cloudy area or something. 
Um, there's also finally the thing we'll talk about, especially with rapid eye, is that there's different frequencies for monitoring. So all of these satellites fly at different heights, they fly at different orbits, and therefore they collect at different frequencies. Something like MODIS might collect twice a day, morning and evening. Some other satellites collect maybe every five to 14 days for Landsat, or geostationary satellites, which actually stay in one area. So this is really important if you want to do repeated monitoring or long-term monitoring or go back in time, the frequency of your satellite collection is really important. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm going to take you through some just different examples of satellites that are out there. This first image is a MODIS image. Um, as you can see, that's the state of New York outlined in red. Um, and basically, we're talking about a very large extent uh, satellite coverage. It's very low resolution. So um, particularly applicable for regional course monitoring, um, but benefiting from the fact that it can actually take images twice a day. So if you want to look at something the size of the, the Northeast, um, this is the type of uh, image you'll look at. Going on to, a, to zooming into a smaller scale, something like Landsat, and this is, now we're zooming into the area of New York, New York City, sorry, and um, this is a Landsat sensor. It's a 30 meter resolution. You can see a lot more detail, and the tile is actually smaller, so it's uh, much smaller than a MODIS level, and um, you're getting more detail, but obviously, you know, focusing in more. We can zoom into that yellow square with another American satellite called Aster, and this has even a smaller extent, so a smaller tile, about one quarter of what a Landsat image is, and um, this satellite collects in 15 and 30 meter resolutions. And then finally, if you want to look at the particular really close detail, well now we can see the actual Statue of Liberty with a quick bird image, which can map anywhere from 60 centimeters and up. Um, so this kind of shows you the range of resolutions that are out there and you know, how practical they, they would be in um, applying to your red project. Next slide, please. All right, so the things that we just discussed now are things like scale and extent. And these are things to consider when you're looking at how big your red project is. Is it a red project? Is it a national level? Is it a provincial level project? Um, so scale is basically how big your map is compared to reality. Um, so looking at the one kilometer scale bars in there, those are different scales of different images. Um, the extent is really how far your image extends. What is the actual area you want to cover? So if you want to cover, for example, the entire country of Mozambique, um, this is a much larger extent and you need much more data and might want to consider different resolutions to really achieve, um, ach achieve your needs there. So these are the things that you really need to consider first and foremost when selecting imagery for your RED project. Next step, please. All right, so we talked also about resolution. So the resolution is actually the smallest size of the object that can be seen. So this is basically what we call pixel size. So um, on the lower right is a, what we call a low resolution image, and that's basically a coarse um, resolution, and you mostly see large objects. So to consider what is the size of the smallest object you want to see. Um, are you interested in mapping actual trees degradation, or are you, you know, more interested in mapping a forest? So a low resolution um, will be more applicable for general things and larger objects, whereas your higher resolution on the left um, is much more fine and smaller. There you can see uh, shadows and individual trees and houses and so on. So um, resolution is a really important factor, and you have to look at the guidelines for your red project, and it will affect many things like your file size and the amount of work you have to do and the amount of detail in your resulting map. Next. All right, so my big... Um, my big uh, uh, statement is less is more, and sometimes um, we are under the impression that high resolution is, auto is always better than low resolution, but in terms of a red MRV project, we really have to consider the trade-offs between higher resolution. So um, having really detailed satellite imagery, it means larger files, you'll need a heftier computer, a better internet connection to download that data, and it's, it's a lot more work, a lot more processing time to actually view the data. Um, we have to consider different tiles and schemes because as we saw higher resolutions collected on a lower, a smaller extent, you have to basically look at different tiles. Like you have on the right side of the slide, you have images collected on different dates and you're going to have uh, different spectral relationships and that's going to be hard to make a consistent map with uh, combining different tiles. So you really have to kind of divide and conquer. Um, finally, an actual, if you look at a map, for example, if you want to map forest and non-forest or variable forest types, you can often have greater error with higher resolution. 
as to the fact that you have artifacts like shadows or maybe individual trees or things like houses or cars or even people or animals in your map, and you have to somehow group them into a forest type. And so that can actually um, hinder the work and reduce your error. So it's really important that for any project, you really only use the resolution you actually need. Um, so define that from the beginning and then select your data accordingly. Next. Right, so this, this slide is about the trade-offs. So basically, you can't have everything. It's, it's really difficult to have high resolution over really large areas, and it's uh, very difficult to have um, high resolution every day. Um, in general, basically, um, yeah, you can't have high resolution over large areas, as you see on the lower left. You'll have lots of little tiles. Um, the satellite will take longer to collect, and it's harder to get data, and it basically gives you too much data at the end, a lot of different footprints to Mosaic, and it's just not a very efficient way of doing things. So if you have a large area, it's better to maybe trade off on your resolution and lower your resolution for a larger extent. Then you have, um, if you look at the temporal resolution, because higher resolution satellites are often at lower altitudes, they don't collect as often as these um, satellites that are higher up. So um, it's really important that you kind of get that trade off. So how often do you need a satellite image? Do you want something every year, every day, every week, every month? You really need to choose that accordingly and, and trade off your resolution there as well. So um, uh, yeah, high resolution can also cost more and it really can prevent you from uh, mapping more frequently. Now this all might have been true I guess, a year ago, but this is actually one of the reasons why I invited RapidEye um, to join us today is because actually RapidEye is one of the um, kind of newest satellites that are launched out there that actually can maybe overcome some of these trade-offs. Uh, Axel will tell us about how you can actually probably have high resolution almost every day. And that's, the, that's kind of the value of RapidEye and, and I think fills a really important niche for this. Next slide. All right, so continuing on our trade-offs, another thing is about cost. And, um, and this is what I really want to touch on the most and um, I'm sure you'll have lots of questions afterwards. But basically, um, if you're developing an MRV system, it's really important to budget for data because um, there's a lot of free satellite imagery out there, but it's really important that you don't count on it and you don't uh, basically assume that your image cost will be zero. And it's really, and that's important to know because there are a lot of free satellite data out there, but generally might not be good quality. They might not be collected when you want them to be. They might not be the right resolution. And because there's so many choices out there, you should really just budget for a little bit of uh, commercial data is what I recommend. So as you see on the right, this is an example of some free data that's out there uh, in Central Africa, and as you can see, it's really cloudy, <laughs> but it's free. So that might not really meet the needs of your project. So um, it's really important that when you develop your budgeting for your, your MRV system that you really accurately estimate data costs. Satellites cost a lot of money, and so does the data. Um, basically, the budget is something you'll figure into your, to your budget and to your which satellite imagery you choose, and that's something um, you can you can easily find um, all the different costs and, and trade-offs and so on. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that you have to often pay for licensing. So if you buy an image, you might you might have to pay more to be able to share it with more people, and licensing really differs by satellite. Um, in some cases, there can be preferred rates for NGOs or red projects, and I'll talk about those in the next couple of slides where you can places to get free or low-cost imagery. And finally, yeah, those consist of uh, image donations, which uh, companies are, you know, gratefully uh, offer to certain projects. But it's really important that we don't abuse that, or that we don't um, basically count on our red project to have a donation. So, if you have a very uh, large project, multi-million-dollar project, it's really a good idea for you to um, to budget for your data and buy it rather than request a donation. Next slide. Right, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about some um, different types of mapping out there. Um, we talked about you know, the need to go back in time, maybe to set your relative uh, your, your reference levels, and look at your past deforestation rates. Um, there's different ways to do that. One of them is, let's say, something like MODIS, um, which might be a good enough low resolution for a regional analysis of deforestation. And this is a satellite um, that I discussed earlier. It's very uh, large extent, low resolution collected twice a day, which can help you overcome clouds, and you can identify change back to 2000. Um, it's a good spectral resolution for vegetation, meaning there's a lot of um, spectral sensitivity to uh, wavelengths that are, that are related to forest and forest health. The, the archive goes back to 2000, and um, I should mention that all this data is free, um, uh, free of cost, and um, 
just some examples, WF Peru and WF Germany are developing some monitoring systems with MODIS, so ways to compile a huge um, timeline of data and look for change in deforestation. Another way to go back in time is the very famous Landsat archive, which is um, a series of six satellites that have, um, were started in 1980, I believe, were launched, and they're very good medium resolution, good 30 meter resolution, good spectral bands with a near-infrared and uh, good vegetation wavelengths. There's a pretty good consistent global coverage, um, and it's free. However, um, a lot of these satellites, you know, they don't last forever, and so they often um, they go defunct or they pass their lifetime, and Landsat was one of them recently. He's kind of on his last legs. However, uh, we are excited that on February 11th, there will be the launch of the next, launch of the next Landsat 8 satellite, which will continue to basically pick up and provide medium resolution data globally. Um, there's also some new Sentinel systems planned from the European Space Agency, um, which will also provide some free data. Um, so those are just some other things to consider. But just, well, the new Sentinel and the new Landsat wouldn't be used for historical baseline mapping, but can basically pick, off, uh, pick up where you left off on your historical mapping. Next slide. Right, so these, um, we talked about regional level, now we can go to a smaller, maybe slightly smaller scale mapping, and I just wanted to highlight some of the applications of SPOT imagery. SPOT also has a very long um, archive of data, goes back to 1983, until now. Um, we have five different SPOT satellites collecting at different resolutions, and they also have a new Pleiad um, constellation that collects at 50 centimeters, so very high resolution. Um, the reason why I wanted to discuss SPOT, particularly here, is because um, they have a Planet Action Foundation from Astrium, and that um, is an organization, basically a nonprofit arm of Astrium, that donates uh, SPOT data, SPOT and actually other, a few other satellite types for specifically for RED projects and climate change action projects. Um, so you can go to their website, you can uh, write a proposal and um, describe what, a what action you'll have or local change to policy, and they will um, provide up to 20 scenes free of cost. Um, the spot scenes are much smaller than Landsat, so you can't focus on very large areas, but it's actually it's a really good resource for, um, for RED projects. Um, another thing is also there are different resolutions here, and it's always good to just pick the resolution that you need and not always pick the highest resolution. Um, they also have, um, there's an image here, um, there's a special kind of archive um, by Astrium and AFD, the French Agency for International Development, and they're providing free spot imagery for the entire Congo Basin for projects related to climate change. So that's another option for free, uh, very high quality data in the Congo. And uh, they have a nice website, uh, you can go and um, search the archive and apply for imagery and so on. And that um, website is listed right there. Next slide, please. All right, and so um, we're going to talk later with Rapid Eye about high resolution. So high resolution does have an important role um, in your Red MRV project, and um, of course, it's recommended for small areas, just in terms of cost and data volume and all of that. Um, there are several companies out there: Digital Globe, GOI are the U.S. commercial companies, and then Rapid Eye um, in Germany. And they all have um, really nice online archives that you can actually search and put your area of interest in, and you can see what data is available and choose cloud coverage and so on. Um, in some cases, you can have preferred pricing for NGOs or even governments. And I find this uh, data is very valuable for validation and verification. Basically, um, if you make a forest map, you can use this high-resolution data to determine how good your classification is or how good your forest map is. Um, and particularly, uh, high resolution is really the only way to um, identify degradation. So basically, small canopy gaps, selective logging, and roads um, is where the high resolution data plays a role. Next. All right, so um, I can't cover everything you need to do um, to make maps for satellite imagery in this presentation, but just in general, some, some suggestions about once you pick your data, um, how to develop your MRV system, and that's, these are things that um, basically your methods, your interpretation methods for satellite imagery must be simple, repeatable, and robust, and have an associated accuracy. That's a general, really important rule to follow. Um, the results should be conveyed, they should be transparent, you should be able to explain them clearly, how one took a satellite image and use it for monitoring, so no black box. Um, methods that's really important, especially um, for local ownership and you know um, sovereignty of these nations doing red. Um, we recommend a semi-automated process, um, so basically partially automated 
methods for interpreting satellite imagery. It helps um, increase the speed of processing and um, basically makes it repeatable, so not having something that only one user can do. It's good to be able to have, um, you know, basically methods that can be shared and repeated. And as we've seen, um, a lot of these web, uh, a lot of these satellites um, have, you know, they have lifespans. So it's really important that when you are planning your MRV system that you don't really tie your monitoring system to one type of satellite because that satellite will inevitably pass away in the future. So try to come up with methods that are sensor independent. Um, and finally, you, there's really no one size fits all for satellite, you know, mapping of forests. Um, it really depends on the region, the size of the region, who's there, what's there. So um, I can't really recommend you know one way to do forest monitoring. Next slide, please. So basically, the rules uh, for choosing your imagery for monitoring, um, and this is just the steps you should go through: is what dates do you need imagery from? Do you need imagery from yesterday or ten years ago? That'll affect uh, what you choose. What is your optimal resolution? How much can you spend? How much is a reasonable amount to spend? Um, when we're talking about red, we're talking about repeated monitoring, so we really need something that's cost effective in the, you know, in the future. It can't be prohibitively expensive or else it won't be long term. Um, I always recommend people to start looking at the archives um, of all these images um, that you can find online and start looking at what's available for your area and it will help you budget uh, what you need. And basically be realistic and prepared to compromise because you're, just, you're never going to find everything you want. You're really going to have to probably mix and match. And of course, ask around. People um, in the region might have already mapped somewhere or might have already bought imagery uh, that you might be able to, to share with them. And most importantly, in a lot of the countries where RED is active, WWF is there. So um, please feel free to talk to us or talk to me. Um, I can help you select imagery that is basically going to, that could benefit all of our partners on the ground as well. Next slide. Yeah, so how to get imagery once you choose, maybe what you like. Look at the free images that are out there, like MODIS, Landsat 8 is launching um, yeah, next, uh, next month. And uh, oh my God, I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, look at the donations from foundations. Um, feel free to try to partner with WWF. Find someone who has data. You know, work with us in these countries. We can share our, um, our data with you in some cases. Um, don't disregard commercial satellite data. It plays an important role in red MRV. Um, and consider that you get what you pay for. So usually um, the data might be more expensive, but you get better quality data and you get specifically what you need and what you require. Finally, there's a lot of international satellites out there. New ones being launched all the time. Japan, India, China, Taiwan all have satellites out there that can really fill uh, a hole if you have it, you know, if you have a cloud-free time period or you really need some data, there's a lot of other potential options out there. I developed a table of data sources. Um, as far as I can tell, I think there's about 40 different satellite sources with their application, with some information on the wavelength, the resolution, where you can get the data, and the general cost on my Dropbox. Uh, feel free to um, copy that link and uh, download a table. Um, I take no responsibility if there's any errors in costs or anything, but they're basically what I've compiled over the past five years. So feel free to use that in your budgeting. Next slide. All right, now I'm going to hand it over to Axel Pendorf, who's joining us from RapidEye, and he'll tell you specifically about um, this new exciting uh, satellite source that you can use for your RED projects. Thanks very much. Um, my name is Axel Pendorf. My background is geography and remote sensing, and within RapidEye, I'm in charge of uh, projects, international projects like RED. Next slide. I'm going to try to speed up because I think we are running out of time a bit, but uh, RapidEye is, a, is, as I said, one of the probably best uh, sources for RED and for remote setting for RED. RapidEye is a global imagery and service provider. We own and operate five satellites in the constellation. They're, they're all the same, they're all equal, they're all um, calibrated against each other, it delivers five meter imagery in five bands. Next. Just a picture from 2008. Uh, this is a, a former, um, former rocket from the, from the Ukraine, from the USSR. 
uh, they took out the nuclear warhead and put in the five satellites that we launched and they were all launched at once in 2008. So our archive actually starts from early 2009. Next. The idea behind the constellation of the five satellites was to image, um, to, to receive a rapid coverage of very large areas. So if you look at that, and I'm not taking clouds into account here because that, that's clear, but it takes about eight days to image very large areas consistently. And if you take the clouds in, into consideration, you can assume that you get the imagery uh, just by the fact that you can revisit every point on Earth every day within a reasonable period of time. And there are challenges in, in the very tropics where even we are facing problems but we've, we've done a pretty good job and you can see that in our archive later on, on most places on Earth. So reliable coverage, uh, best imaging chances in cloudy areas, same season coverage, sometimes even multiple coverages per year. Um, yeah, next slide. Just, and this is kind of a living document, just an overview on our um, uh, national coverage contributions in uh, globally for red and s just some highlights. It's Central America, it is um, Brazil, it is Mexico with a multiple coverage for the last two years. It's Guyana which is probably one of the most advanced um, red projects globally and other places where actually that's just the national coverages we, we did and do provide data for pilot projects all over the place, which you can't see here. Next slide. So just to kind of summarize the red requirements that are met by RapidEye, it's the regular reliable monitoring wall-to-wall -wall on a national scale. It's data continuity, the system was launched and is operational since 2009. We're going to probably be operational for the next few years. It all looks good so far and it's five satellites and we are, we are actually planning a follow-up mission or at least thinking about it. The high detailedness with a minimal mapping unit of uh, 0.5 hectare for forest degradation. Um, the availability of data through so-called background missions which fill our archive and the positional accuracy or better yet the co-registration that we can do for change detection from one image to the other. Next. Um, just one example of what we can contribute is true color rapid eye mosaics. That's not overly important because people usually want to work with the pixels and the bands, but we do have them available as backdrops and that's a, a nice example of the of uh, Congo DRC uh, coverage from 2011 and 2012 and you see some clouds but given the, the um, location in the tropics it's actually a fairly cloud free coverage with less than 6% clouds. Next. Um, all five satellites have five bands, three of them in the visible range blue, green and red and two of them in the near infrared one in the so-called red edge um, area and that has proven to be very effective for biomass monitoring. Next slide. Um, that's our archive since 2009 and it's a kind of heat map so the more brownish the more often we have it in our archive. So you can see and I don't want to hide it from you, there is white spots uh, on the planet that we haven't imaged so far, but we've got a good solid coverage over most areas globally and keep in mind it's all fresher than 2009 or 2008, so um, this is an impressive archive that we have. Next slide. And Talking about our website, we, we do show country coverage overviews for uh, many of the relevant red countries. 
just to to make the, the first access for you easier to show what is in the archive. And I'm going to show you the archive and how to access the archive later on. Next slide. Uh, I don't want to kind of compare apples and oranges, but Lancet is a great data source for uh, large-scale monitoring, has always been and will be, as Aurelie said, the next sentence is going to be launched. And it's just perfect for deforestation and uh, clear cuts and monitor these. But if you look into the, the, the one half of red, the forest degradation, uh, if you compare it, you can see that with the five meter rapid eye imagery, you can actually see forest degradation without needing an overkill like a sub meter resolution. Next slide. Just a few other examples um, with timelines. When we imaged that specific area, um, basically two months later, the, the, the clear-cut uh, organization legally or illegally have done a good job on, uh, on entering the forest. Next slide. And then talking about timelines, um, you can see the, the growth of the impact of the forest degradation here, but if you look at the basically the white arrow in the lower half, uh, hopefully you can see that in the third image the regrowth actually has already taken place and you can't see it anymore with uh, satellite imagery. But the point is that, um, that the vegetation that has uh, uh, shown up in plates like that doesn't doesn't um, compare with the original vegetation. Next slide. So talking about our archive, how to access that, it's basically ifind.rapideye.com and then you find an entry screen like that and basically on the left hand side you select uh, your time of interest between which dates you want to see the imagery. Then you define cloud cover and uh, things like black fill, which is, a, I'm not going to explain that in detail right now. You can choose between level 3A, which is the auto product that we have, and the level 1B product. And then you can either upload shapefiles, KML, KMZ, or you draw a boundary, or you choose a political boundary, all sorts of options that you have, and then you get a result. Next slide. And I've just picked Vietnam as a good but not super example. You can see there are some white spots, but it has been imaged as a so-called background mission without any customer order. So uh, there wasn't uh, pressure to actually get a full coverage. Um, but what you can see, what you see here is our coverage from 2012. And then if you have a result like that, you can click on any of these tiles on the right-hand side and you get the alternatives that are available on the left-hand side for each of those tiles. And then you can actually exchange the results by, no, I want a better one or a different one and what have you. And then you can refresh your search and you can basically save it, you can export it, you can send it to us, all these options. Next slide. Well, that's it, and I guess we're, we're going to be available for questions and answers right now. Thank you. So, thank you so much to Axel and Orly for those great presentations, and the floor is now open for questions. So, the first question that we have um, comes from, let's see, Wesley, and Wesley asks, what monitoring intervals would you suggest for a local scale red MRV system with budget as a limiting factor? Yeah, I think um, I think for a lot of the reporting we see, I think annual fluorization is probably um, good enough. Um, and also, you, know, you should consider what are your drivers of deforestation. Is deforestation very rapidly occurring or not? But generally, I find that there's annual reporting is good enough uh, for project level, and so that's which. Um, that's what you would look for, and the good thing is, is that in a year you can usually image quite nicely an area of you know the small uh, 
small location. And so depending on your resolution or depending on how big your area is, you could probably easily within your budget, you know, image it once a year. Um, so our next question comes from, let's see who this is from. Um, this one says, I'm working on spot images that we received from Planet Action. I'm not able to correct the topography using the topographic normalization model. Do you have any insight or tips on that? <laughs> Good question. Uh, I guess that's been my problem with, with spot imagery sometimes is that it's, uh, it's one of the things you need to consider, I guess, the spatial accuracy. So some of the imagery, the way it's delivered is not spatially accurate. Um, I guess I can help with, uh, with suggestions for um, other modules or other ways to work, but basically what we're going to need is um, some GPS locations, accurate GPS locations on the ground of features that you can recognize in the imagery, which you can then use to, um, to correct the image. But um, that's often an issue in, in topographic areas, like we've seen this problem in Nepal and in areas in Borneo where um, we have lots of uh, hilly terrain. Um, yeah, that can be pretty tough to deal with, but um, it can be overcome with some field work. And I can provide some offline responses to that as well. So the next question is um, just a clarification from one of our, list one of our listeners, and, um, and he asks, um, can we have access to RapidEye for free for our RED projects? Can you clarify? <laughs> I wish that would be the case, and I'm very open to enter into discussions on specific projects, so please feel free to contact me on the email addresses that are provided. We do actually provide, and we did provide, um, test data for pilot projects, um, uh, so I can't make any promises here, and it truly would depend on the availability in the archive and the size of the project. But I, I'd like to encourage you to actually get in touch with me. Thank you. So our next question is from Mark. And Mark asks, are samples available from the south southeastern US from RapidEye to make comparisons with existing products before taking a red effort overseas? Um, we, we do provide test imagery from various places on our website, and you, you just have to register and, and request for it. If there's any problem or and or there's any specific area that you want, again, please contact me. Either I will come back to you with a meaningful answer, or I'll connect you with my colleagues in the US. I can also say that I think generally in the US is probably one of the best imaged areas in the world. Um, by the USGS and NASA, um, so there, there's probably there's rapid eye data, but there might be other sources as well. Um, actually, state agencies often map their state very well, so depending on where it is, um, you can find data for the US. But technically, the archive-wise, there is plenty of data over yeah. the US from rapid eye and other sources. Yeah, it's, it's a good cloud-free area to image. <laughs> Our next question comes from Joseph, and Joseph asks, can you advise which model is the best to ortho-rectify? Oh, good question. I, I guess that, that really depends on the area, I guess. Um, uh, yeah, it, it all depends on location, so there's really no one size fits all. Um, it really depends. Sorry. But you can, Joseph can contact me, and I can help him. Okay, Joseph, so feel free to contact Orly after this webinar for some more information. Up next, Peter asks, how do you control and monitor leakages in your different RED projects? Good question. Um, that's an excellent question. Yeah, so um, the key there is to make sure that you have imagery uh, you know, inside and outside of your project area. Um, if you want to look whether deforestation is moving from your project area to outside, it's always good to basically, uh, it's recommended to have a kind of larger area um, to map and to look at, and that's how you can evaluate that. Um, you might not need the same maybe detail of imagery as you have in your project, but um, you definitely need to look at a bigger area to see whether uh, your deforestation is moving outside, if you're just moving it or you're actually reducing deforestation. So yeah, you definitely need to look at the whole area of interest. And often that might be um, a political boundary. If your project is in a province, you might look at the whole province, the whole territory. 
and actually see whether your overall uh, deforestation is being reduced. So you'll have to account for that. Great. Our next question is, what approach would you suggest for afforestation programs in areas that are currently mostly savanna in terms of resolution? Wow, okay. That's an excellent question. Um, savanna is really tough. Um, yeah, you're going to want to look at the medium to high resolution. Um, so, yeah, anywhere from rapid eye 5 meter to Landsat, um, but maybe even more on the higher resolution side because um, savanna is can be sparsely trees with grass, um, and that can be really difficult to map kind of as the baseline. And then, um, yeah, then you want to revisit to look at uh, look at new forest cover. Yeah, I would highly recommend on the higher resolution. And the other thing to consider with savanna, which I find extremely difficult, is that it's uh, very dynamic. So when it rains, it gets very green, and when it's dry, it gets very brown. Um, and it can look like deforestation or it can look like changes, but it's just basically the natural process. So for that, what you're going to want is uh, actually multi-temporal imagery, so maybe uh, from different seasons or from multiple seasons in a year or always from the same season. And so that's something you need to consider. So it might not just be one image a year, but it might be multiple images. And you'll look at the driest moment and the wettest moment and see how they, um, how they change over time. So it's really important to keep in mind. Great, thank you. So lots of questions here. The next question is, is there a degree of inaccuracy in remote sensing data? Do you have any evidence of field work to calibrate your data? If so, which model are you using to estimate biomass from field data? Okay, so there's a lot of questions there. So inaccuracies, so I, uh, first we can talk about spatial inaccuracy. Um, that's usually delivered with the imagery. So for example, Landsat, I think they say that their images, imagery is accurate within five or ten meters, um, and, and different uh, imagery is different. What about rapid eye? Do you know what the spatial... Well, that depends on them. That comes back to another question earlier. That depends on the availability of ground control ponds, and that's something that is valid for uh, spot rapid eye and all the, all the sensors. Yes. I mean, there's some sort of onboard accuracy, but at the end of the day, it comes down to ground control ponds, wherever they come from. Yeah. So that might be existing ground control, meaning like a very well located point on the earth that you can tie into your image, or you go out and you collect that yourself with a GPS and a very precise location. You can you basically tie your image down and you uh, make it more accurate. If you're talking more about thematic accuracy and mapping biomass, well, um, the rule for satellite imagery, um, interpreting biomass from satellite imagery, we've seen that there's basically a saturation problem. And as soon as you get to areas that have biomass, let's say over what, 100 tons of carbon per hectare, you basically have a saturation problem where you can't accurately see or measure carbon more than that level. So for tropical forests, you can't really directly map biomass from satellite imagery. You really need to use uh, forest inventory and um, and basically link to other brown data and plots and so on. Um, but for lower biomass areas, you can generally pretty accurately map biomass. Um, uh, results have shown with uh, radar data, like ALOS Pulsar, um, we've actually had pretty good estimates within 80% like, accuracy of um, actual biomass from radar data. So those are some of the general, um, general accuracies. Great. So our next question is from Gaston. Are there any specific recommend, recommended methodologies for the use of satellite data in RED MRV? Um, yeah, there's probably a lot. So the, there's the RED what, best practice guidelines. That um, is a big tome <laughs> that will explain basically the best ways to interpret your satellite imagery and recommend semi-automated methods and, um, and things like that. So that's probably your first place to look. Um, that's, yeah, and, and basically in general, like I said before, it should be something semi-automated, should be something repeatable, transparent, that doesn't take a lot of work uh, that anybody can do and, and can be pretty, you know, pretty straightforward and repeatable. That's really the most important, I think, for a red system. Up next, John asks, if there are community MRV projects, um, ground truthing areas on the ground, is there an opportunity for RapidEye to bring this data together and hold it centrally so it can be used by others? I'm not fully sure if I get the question, but um, there's, if, if you mean if we could use the ground control points or the ground truths and actually bring it together with the, the imagery, 
are we talking about awesome rectification or are we talking about the yeah. And can you speak a little closer to the microphone? It's tough to hear you. I'm sorry. I mean, let, let me let me maybe answer it with, with respect to also rectification. Um, we are providing two data formats. One is the also rectified one, and we would use national scale um, ground control points for that. Uh, we we do offer for the same price basically. Uh, non also rectified imagery and then everybody can use their own ground control points that they get from the field and also rectify it. If we are talking about the value adding and the to derive uh, biomass from satellite imagery and compare it with ground cruising, Rapid I would not do that themselves, but we would have partners who could support you on that. And uh, yeah, that's probably the two questions for one answer. One yeah, I can, I can even add just from our experiences in Congo, one of the things that um, we would do maybe with the local partners, yeah, if we had rapid eye data or other data, we would, we could actually, yeah, or direct provide it maybe ourselves. But most of the um, key components of the red system is kind of a central database for data, and that can include plots, that should include uh, ground control points, and things like that. So the central uh, agency related to RED, or the, or the, whether it's the government or an NGO, would basically unite that data and bring it together with the satellite imagery and provide whatever you know, ground truthing or, or correction that would be needed. That's the way I would say it to them, yeah. So next, Tobias asks, it is important to budget for data. What about EO service experts, e.g., for ortho rectification and accurate, accurate classification? Do you have any thoughts on that? That's a great point. Um, capacity um, is different everywhere. So some countries have excellent capacity, like in country, and other ones, others might not. Um, and uh, and yeah, I think the, the the small businesses, the big businesses, basically the, the agencies that have proven expertise in doing whether it's classifications or rectifications or all those things, um, they can be used. Um, and uh, yeah, if you budget for that, you can definitely employ um, a company to basically help you do your work for you if you want. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's all about evaluation of cost, and um, I think that, that also plays a role, and that's what I think a lot of European companies are supporting um, this role by, by kind of adding, doing the value-added things. So if you can't, if you don't have the software or don't have the expertise to you know, process the data yourself, you can find a company or even a university that could help you do that. Great, thank you. And up next, I can answer this question. Timothy asks, can you make this presentation available online? Yes, if you look at the slide that's up right now, this learning session will be up um, on the URL you see there, and um, you can watch the presentation again. It will be uh, recorded and also available on our YouTube channel. So rest assured that you can watch it again or share it with your colleagues. Our next question is from Wesley, and Wesley asks, can you suggest websites with documents detailing best practices in terms of MRV and EO processing? Yeah, that's going to be more, uh, there's a lot of IPCC best practice guidelines um, that are on the web, or I recommend going to the Red Desk. It has a good um, compilation of methodologies. Um, I uh, bet you a lot of our RWF um, forest and climate pages will also have a lot of uh, information as well. We have our own MRV team. Um, there's definitely a lot of resources out there. Um, so yeah, I, I just said a few. So there's a lot online. Great, thank you. So Basanta asks, we do not have rapid eye from the past. So how can we calculate past emissions if we use rapid eye now? Yeah. So I guess, um, and that's one of the things that will that you kind of have to consider. Sometimes you have to mix and match. So for your historical data, you know, we're just we have to use what's available. And it might be Landsat, it might be Aster, it might be Modis. You kind of have to use what's available, and then um, you might have to just mix resolutions. So um, it might be useful to have a high resolution map currently from something like RapidEye, and then um, you go back in time with something more coarse and you try to bring those resolutions together as best as you can. But unfortunately, that's the problem. <laughs> we always get to collect everywhere, and, and even unfortunately in Africa, there's huge holes in the Landsat archive that makes um, historical remote sensing really, really difficult, and we're just not lucky in that respect. So a follow-up question to that, also from Basanta, is in Nepal, in the Nepal FRA project, we bought RapidEye 3A product, but we had a 60-meter displacement, which is pretty big. 
Can you talk about those kinds of discrepancies? Yes, I can. I mean, already mentioned that in, in areas like Nepal, um, you are facing problems doing the also rectification just for the, the differences in altitude. I mean, this is again something that probably all satellite data providers would face in places like that. And I have to admit that I mean, we are using the SRTM global uh, digital elevation model and it is not superb in places like Nepal with such, uh, such a terrain. And our ground control points differ a lot globally. We have countries and coverages where they are most excellent. But we have countries where they are medium, I would say. So, but as far as I remember, we provided basically, I mean, it was some sort of misunderstanding in the past of that Nepalese project, but we also provided the Net1B data set afterwards free of charge in order to enable the people from Nepal to actually do their own auto rectification and come up with, with better results. Okay, um, great. So, um, are there, Orly and, and Axel, are there any other costs or needs that our users should consider when they're considering satellite imagery, imagery to monitor for us for RED? Yeah, if you're going to do your own monitoring, uh, really important is to consider software. Um, there are lots of open source softwares out there, um, lots to choose from, um, and there are also commercial software. It's kind of a, it's a, it's a budget thing and what you're most comfortable with. Um, the Planet Action um, grants actually include software from ESRI, which is ArcGIS, and ENVI, um, and I think eCognition. So um, you can actually get, uh, with your imagery, you can get the software you need to actually process the data. And they might even include training. Um, there's also a lot of training online if you want to learn how to use GIS and things like that. There's just a lot of resources online. Um, ESRI runs a virtual campus. You can do classes online without leaving your desk. Um, so that's really going to be uh, one of your, I think, biggest costs. And then most importantly, actually, what I think people maybe don't always do with your fourth mapping, it's really important to ground truth. And that means once you have your map, um, to go into the field, into the ground, and really systematically evaluate the accuracy of your forest cover map. Um, because without your accuracy, you really don't know what you're measuring. So um, choose your confidence interval wisely. Choose your accuracy that you're looking for and really um, systematically go on the ground with a camera, with a GPS, and evaluate what's on the ground and see how well your map actually correlates with reality. Great. Thank you. And I think that does it for today's webinar. Thank you so much for all of our participants and those great questions. And again, thank you to Orly and to Axel for joining us today. If you have further questions or want to follow up, please feel free to send an email to forestclimate at www.panda.org. Um, you can also stay connected by following our Twitter account or by visiting our website. And again, we hope this was a, a useful and informative presentation, and thanks for being with us today. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank thanks, you. everyone. Goodbye.